Does this manufacturing? Or is it farming? Looks an awful lot like manufacturing. They're cracking the eggs too. What do you think they're making? So what about McDonald's? So what about McDonald's? Is it manufacturing? I mean, they add heat, right? That's a, that could be a manufacturing process. I'm not, I'm not so certain that they're they're cooking. So uh, so actually, you know, you you watch the news and they talk about like the manufacturing numbers are up or the manufacturing numbers are down. You know that they include McDonald's in the manufacturing numbers, right? That McDonald's is a manufacturing company by that metric. Um, is uh, is manufacturing doing well or poorly in the United States right now? Yeah. All right. All right. So let's let's focus. Um, people that do machining. People that do CNC machining. So manufacturing that requires CNC machining for it to happen, like as a process that they do. I think that's that's up or down in the U.S. right now. What what do you hear about on the news when they talk about this stuff? When they're talking about, especially manufacturing other industries, what do you hear about on the news when they're talking about it? So, so people talk about outsourcing. Um, there's a button here, document camera. There's a button for that. Maybe. You have to actually give it something to focus on for the autofocus to work. A piece of white paper is hard to focus on. I'm going to remember to stop the YouTube video so it doesn't play indefinitely over here on the other screen. So, so people talk about outsourcing, and and when they're talking about outsourcing, is that a good thing or a bad thing? So, how does the media typically talk about outsourcing? Media usually says outsourcing is bad, right? So media And so when the media says outsourcing is bad, why are they saying that it's bad? Yeah. Because so we're talking here so here you're talking about outsourcing over seas. Right? And so the media says it's bad because less American American right. So if our companies are outsourcing overseas, there's fewer American jobs. Is that good or bad? Bad. Bad for who? Bad for the people whose jobs they were. Pretty good for those guys in India that got the jobs, though, right? So good and bad is really hard to measure here because it was really good for the place where the jobs went. It was bad for the place where the jobs left. So people talk about outsourcing when they talk about manufacturing and, um, and the fact that it reduces jobs. Now, why? Oh, but what happens to the stock prices to the companies that outsource? Stock values go up when companies outsource. And it doesn't, it doesn't, as a general rule, right? Stock prices will go up. So, what does that tell you about? So, is that good or bad for the economy? If, yeah, I mean, so actually, when the stock price goes up, 
how do you capitalize on that? So if you're a shareholder or if you're somebody that's in the stock market, the stock values go up, how do you capitalize? They may pay more dividends, but I bet you dividends is more tied to cash flow than it is to stock value in, in a lot of cases. And um, but, but how do you capitalize on um, the value of the stock going up? You have to sell the stock, right? In order, and, and when you do, then you pay taxes on that too. So, so there's other things. Now, now people feel good because their stock prices went up and their net worth went up. It's all paper though, right? They can't spend it at the grocery store unless they sell the stock. All right, so, so is it good or bad for the economy? It, it really depends on where you are in the economy, right? It's certainly bad for the people that lost their job if they don't have a backup plan. Right. So, all right. So, outsourcing is one thing. What else do we talk about when we talk about manufacturing in the United States? Oh, did you know, by the way, that the manufacturing in the United States has been growing and growing and growing and growing, and the the value that is being produced by U.S. manufacturing goes up and up and up and up every year. At the same time, they talk about Job losses in manufacturing, right? Is it all from outsourcing? Yes. Um, I want to clarify: is that manufacturing like factory farming, or manufacturing as in specialized manufacturing? I don't have data at my fingertips. My understanding is yes, both. Um, so there, there is the the factory farming contribution to manufacturing. But but it's it's all of it is going up. The the productivity is going up. The number of jobs is going down. Is it all because of outsourcing? What's that? We could use robots. Who's ever used a robot? Years ago, when I was a grad student here at WPI, I was the TA for the robotics class. And uh, the guy that taught the class had a very really Chinese Chinese accent. And so every time somebody says robot, I just think Lobot. Um, so it's kind of funny for me since I'm out now on the faculty for the Lobotics department here at WPI also. <laughs> He's a great guy, though. Um, all right, so outsourcing, media says it's bad. Robots, what does the media like about robots? What does the media say about robots? And so, is robot the right word to use here? Yeah. How about if we broaden this robot to be automation? Because you can auto so, what's a robot? First of all, what's a, what's a robot to you? Vince, what's a robot? Uh, like a robot. So a robot for you has intelligence, has some sort of machine learning and, and can do its job better over time. Yeah. So when we watched at the, the beginning of this video here, maybe were you here for the beginning of the video? No? Okay. Um, but when you watch a robotic arm in a manufacturing cell doing this, we call it a robotic arm, right? Is that a robot by your definition? No. No. Okay. So, so that's not robotics to me. It's just like anybody know that anybody know where the word robot came from? Yeah. It's similar. It's so it was a guy who actually wrote a play. Yeah. It was a Czech playwright, and um, and and so the robots there were autonomous automatons, right? But it's just like people, right? And it comes from the, the word that means slave. It's someone to do a task for you, basically, right? And so we've, we've adopted that. And so the, the word robot, robot actually comes from science fiction. And, and now we use it in industry. So it's kind of kind of cool. Um, and so the, the intent of this robot thing at the beginning really was, the, I think, the artificial intelligence in this understanding. I mean, so 
when you're um, when you're oh telephone who's had a phone call from a robot some of them are really good I used to get this robot Jason that called me all the time first he was trying to sell me a home security system and uh, I was probably three calls in to telling Jason no thank you when I realized Jason was not a person and then Jason called me years later trying to sell me something else, and it was really funny. And uh, Jason would always hang up, though. He said, Jason, what's your birthday? He would always hang up. It was outside of his programming, right? Okay, um, so let's get back to uh, jobs. We start, we're talking about jobs, outsourcing, automation. This is causing the number of manufacturing jobs to go down, yet the value of the manufacturing companies to go up. Right, so the value of the manufacturing companies is going up. The amount of work that they're throughputting is going up. The, uh, if, you, if you look at manufacturing and manufacturing jobs in the U.S., so does manufacturing just employ the people that work in the factory? No, what else, who, else they get, who else gets employed because of manufacturing? Yeah? Distributors. Distributors, truck drivers who ship the products, distribution companies who distribute the products. Who else gets paid? Producers, Producers meaning? Oh, yeah, yeah. The manufacturing companies have manufacturing companies that are their vendors. Right? One of, one of the things that I always thought of, because you know, we, I, my wife and I own a couple manufacturing companies, and uh, one of the things that we always thought of is if our customers and our vendors can be profitable, then we've got a place. There's a spot in the ecosystem. As long as we can make sure our customers and our vendors can remain profitable, we can be profitable. Right. So, but so, who else besides the other manufacturing companies that are upstream or downstream could be the customers. Um, yeah. The construction company that built the manufacturing plant. The retail store that sold the manufactured goods once they get chopped through the distributor, through the trucking company, to the retail store. So yeah. Hey, the engineers. We're a cost, but we get paid, right? Um, so, so this manufacturing actually drives our economy. Who, who's not impacted? Maybe the forex trader. Maybe, but if he's trading stocks on a manufacturing company, then I don't know. I don't trade in the forex markets. Um, all right, so. One way to look at this is this manufacturing process, this taking raw materials, modifying the raw materials, turning them into something the customer wants, right? That's manufacturing. That manufacturing process creates wealth. It, it is what creates new wealth. How else can you create wealth? Besides by taking a raw material and turning it into something somebody wants. You can dig it up out of the ground, right? So you can dig wealth up out of the ground. I would argue that farming, you can, you can coax wealth into existence by nurturing it on a farm, right? Is there anything else that creates wealth? I haven't thought of it yet. Wealth is created by manufacturing. All right, hey, what is wealth, by the way? My daughter always asked me, Daddy, when are we going to be rich? I said, we're rich. She said, but then how come I can't buy everything I want at the store? I said, I didn't say we were wealthy. <laughs> right? But, but what is wealth? Is it a pile of money somewhere, a pile of gold somewhere? Yeah. Really, I think wealth is potential value. Right? It actually doesn't have value until you give it to somebody else in exchange for something you want. But wealth is potential value. Okay, so, but manu and manufacturing creates it. Um, you, could, you could change potential value by being really good at sales, perhaps, right? Really good at sales and marketing. So you can change the perceived value of something, right? And again, your customers, your customers should always value the thing you're selling more than you value it. Otherwise, you should be selling it for a higher price, right? So, all right, but, but manufacturing creates wealth. If we outsource, where does the wealth get created?
Anybody? The place where we outsource it to, right? Uh, it's, this is actually... Uh, everybody stand up. Arms up. Let's do a little to the side here. What is this? The crescent pose? Sort of. Oh, he's not even, he's, he's got his arms like at his forehead. Rough night? Yeah. Okay, now jump once. Jump one more time. All right. Get more excited about this class. Let me start over. All right. So manufacturing creates wealth, okay? Do we buy that? We buy that? This is like the thing in my life that I am the most passionate about. When I, when I started teaching here at WPI, it was to find out if I would like teaching. Because I didn't need to, because I had retired already. Right? So, and not for manufacturing. Real estate also helps you collect wealth. Um, but I wanted to learn if I like teaching. I really like teaching. But it's much more fun when you guys interact with me. So let's do that. Let's interact. Okay, so manufacturing creates wealth. It gets created at the place where you do the manufacturing. Why would we want to do manufacturing here? Yes. To create wealth, but why do it here? Because I could totally move to Singapore and do it. Yeah. Because we friggin' live here. That's why we want to create wealth here. It's nice to be in the wealthy place. Sucks to not be in the wealthy place. Right? Who's ever lived off ramen noodles? Come on, come on, be proud. Why did you live off ramen noodles? Oh, you don't have to say it. It could be a personal reason. You're cheap? Okay. I was a student here at WPI. I went on a year exchange program to Sweden. While I was in Sweden, yeah, my father stopped working. Kind of a complex situation. He quit his job to go buy into a company, and then he didn't like the partners at the company he bought into, so he got his money back, and then he just didn't have a job anymore. He got his money back, but he didn't have a job anymore. But I'm in Sweden. They send me a check every month. I wanted to go to France to go skiing. In fact, I really wanted to go to France to go skiing. But I didn't want to ask my parents for any more money because I knew my father didn't have a job. So I lived on ramen noodles for about two months in order to pay for that trip to France to go skiing. <laughs> Sad to say, that's probably the worst economic hardship I ever went through. So I can't really talk about economic hardship. But um, let's see. All right, so manufacturing creates wealth. Automation is one of the things that helps manufacturing create wealth. Now, it sucks for the people that don't have a job anymore. But what can we do if our company is creating more wealth? By automating, yeah. Uh, we could reinvest in our company, and we could hire more people to do different things. So, so a lot of times, and, and I, do, I do consulting here where I help companies understand if they should automate, if they want to automate. And a lot of times, the reason they want to automate a process is because Vince has been loading these parts in this machine. And they want Vince to go do something that's more valuable with his time. So it's not because they want to get rid of him. It's because they want him to do something more valuable. All right, so... We've got, um, so automation, what is automation then? We understand, what we've, we've got a clear grasp that we want to do it because it's going to help us create more wealth. What is automation? All right, so if we're going to automate, let's have a machine. So that Matt can do something more valuable. I know there's two Matts in the class. Where are you guys? There's one. All right, there's only one Matt in the class here, here today. Hi, Matt. Hope you're having fun. Is, is, do you know for a fact that he's watching, or you just guess? <laughs> is the mic live? He can hear everything? I like that feedback sometimes. All right, so if he has a question or wants to answer a question, he can text it to you, and, uh, and you can tell me. All right, so machine that completes a task. Uh, let's get some examples. Some things that you've seen automated. So, all right, so we could use a robot 
as part of our automation system. So there's to automate, right? This is a verb, right? It, what, so what does it mean to automate? Um, Bill Gates has a, a famous quote about automation. Anybody know what it is? If you automate a bad process, then you simply do the bad process more efficiently or faster, right? So, but what, is, what does it mean to automate? It means to make the stuff happen without you having to input, right? So we automate, we're making the stuff happen. <laughs> Over in the, in the manufacturing labs, what, what direction? Over in the manufacturing labs, I'm facing the wrong direction. Um, one of the ways we automate stuff is by having a work study do it. If a work study is doing it, I'm not. That's a method to automate. In fact, hiring employees to do something so that you don't have to do it, if you're the, if you're the business owner, is a form of automation. Um, but you want to use a machine to do it, and so do I. All right, so a machine that completes a task. Is that all that goes into automate? So you, your example was a robot. It doesn't have to be a robot, though, right? Could just be an arm that, or, or a slider that goes back and forth. Right? In the video we watched at the beginning of class, there was lots of things going on that were automated that none of us would have called a robot. I think, right? In my, in my mind, a robot is one of those arm things or one of these things that does this or Jason that calls me on the phone trying to sell me home security systems. Um, I, think, I think robots are growing into the AI thing that you're, you're thinking. And the only reason it wasn't that way at the beginning was because we didn't have the technology yet. That technology is evolving. Okay, so automation does a task for us. What kind of tasks? What kind of tasks do we want to automate? Yeah. So we like to automate repetitive tasks. How did I? Repeat. That's repeat, right? Stuff. I can't spell repetitive. You guys couldn't see it, but you said I spelled repeat, right, huh? Repeat stuff. We want to automate repeat stuff. What other kind of stuff do we want to automate? Yeah. Why do we want to automate simple tasks? I'll write it down, but why? All right, so it's a candidate for automation because we can envision how to make a machine do it. And that's why you mean simple. Okay, I got that. What else do we want to automate? Boring. Is that what you meant? Or it could be long too. But boring, right? Why do we want to automate boring stuff? Yeah, so usually if we're automating a boring thing, and it is probably also simple, right? If it's boring, it's probably simple. The risk of the person doing it, getting bored with the task, and daydreaming, and then screwing it up, is high. So that's that's that makes those a good candidate. What else do we want to automate? Yes. Dangerous tasks. Danger. O U S. Stuff. Anybody been over Washburn 108 and seen the uh, the Atlas robot? It's over there. So the whole idea of that challenge that that robot came here for was that you could have an automated system, a robot, that could go into, say, a nuclear power plant that was on fire and shut the thing down manually without having to send people in. And so the idea of that project came out of the uh, Fukushima disaster. Um, Dangerous stuff, long time stuff, boring stuff, simple stuff, repeat stuff. What else do we want to automate? Complicated stuff. Complicated stuff. 
complicated stuff. Yeah, I agree. So, so, so we want to, we want to do these. And I would say this long one in here, right? We want to do this stuff to eliminate mistakes. Long stuff we might want to automate to speed up. Because if we can speed up the process, we might be able to make more money with it. Right? So, and, and you know, I think all of them you might want to automate to speed up if speeding up is going to help you make more money. So, repeat stuff, simple stuff, boring stuff, long time stuff, dangerous stuff, complicated stuff. What else? Yeah. So stuff so you don't have to pay in. All right. So stuff where we could eliminate a job. Get rid of who's the employee. I need a name. Nate. All right, we're trying to get rid of Nate. I mean, I always use Joe, and I feel like I'm picking on Joe. We're going to get rid of Joe. I should be more gender neutral and also sometimes say Josephine, right? <laughs> right. Uh, repeat stuff, simple stuff. To, all right. So... Do you guys ever eat at Hagen's house down down the hill here? Did I talk about this yesterday, two days ago? Okay, never mind. I knew I talked to some class about it. Yeah. Hey. So he can do something more. We want to get rid of Nate so he can do something more important. He, he, he discussed it with his family, and he's going to move on to a new career choice. Truck driving school is run, running ads right now. <laughs> Although, aren't we automating that, too? It'll be a while. Um, all right, so are these the reasons we automate? Well, I think we're increasing our manufacturing. We're just having fewer people do it. Yeah. A different age. It is the dawning of the age of information. Right, right, but you're, you're, so, and, and that's that's a big media thing, right? You see, we're we're moving out of the industrial age into the information age, right? That's in the media all the time, right? In the, in the it, it, so it's totally true. And we can do our, and, and one of the things that we can automate is the information side of the manufacturing business, right? Because what, uh, ultimately, what's the goal of manufacturing? What does every manufacturing company have to do to survive? They have to make money, but how do you make money if you're a manufacturing company? Create value, and how do you know you have value? People paid for your stuff. How do you know they paid for it? Because they gave you the money, right? And so every manufacturing business, the overriding concern has got to be to get the people the thing the people want or the people need, right? I, I like to say get the people the thing they need. Uh, but that means you have to negotiate with your customers sometimes because sometimes they ask for the wrong thing. But, but if you really want to serve your customer, you have to get them the thing they need, not the thing they asked for. Um, it's hard to do sometimes. So... All manufacturing companies have to get the stuff to the customer. And what goes into getting the stuff to the customer, there's a lot of it's information, right? And so we can automate the information side of manufacturing too. And, um, but every, all these, these, these pundits that say we're, oh, if, here's the one that gets me the most. Who's heard the term service economy? We're moving to a service economy. 
Yeah, yeah. So if we're if manufacturing is what creates new wealth, and we're moving to a service economy instead of a manufacturing economy, which I actually don't think is true. The United States is not moving to a service economy. They just like to talk about it on the news. But if we're doing that, if manufacturing creates wealth and everything else trades wealth around, would you believe that there are some people better at trading wealth than you? What happens? All the wealth goes to the top, right? Because some people are better at it. And if we're not creating new wealth at the bottom, there's none left for the rest of us. So I, I hate the whole thing of, oh, we want to become a service economy, because that's just stupid. That's how the country fails. Um, did I mention that I'm passionate about this? All right, so if we want to... Um, <clears throat> All right, so um, what does it cost to automate? I, I, I'd say this is a good list of reasons to automate. What does it cost to automate? If I want to automate something, all right, so if I want to automate um, a process, let's automate the T-nut manufacturing process. Right, you guys have all made those T-nuts last week. If we want to automate the T-nut manufacturing process, what do we have to do? What are the steps? What are the physical steps that we had to do in order to manufacture the tea nuts? Yeah. Because automate means take out the physical step and and have it happen automatically, right? So physical steps once we have the product. So we've designed the product. So don't worry about engineering. We've designed the product. We understand the processes to make it. Um, what are the physical steps we have to do? That's done. Let's just assume that that part's done. Because we've, we've already made a prototype. We've already brought our prototype to market and found out that our customers want to buy our prototype. And so now we need to scale up manufacturing so that we can make those boatloads of money. Because my daughter wants to be wealthy. Um, well, just say we're going to use the same processes that we use, but we just want to automate that. Yeah. All right, so let's just look at the physical steps of making the part first, right? First thing we have to do is receive the stock material. Now, the stock material that you guys used came in a six foot long bar. And then we cut it to what, inch and a quarter long pieces or something? Did you guys cut it to inch and a quarter long pieces? Yeah, okay, good. If the TAs cut it for you, I was gonna be pissed. Because we're not good at storing leftover inch and a half long pieces. We're just not. We're not a warehouse company. All right, so we have to receive the stock material. We have to prep the stock material. Right? So we've got to take it from that 6 foot, 12 foot, 36 foot long bar and make it be the inch and a quarter long pieces. Okay, then what? What's the next step after we've prepped the stock material? Uh, yeah. We're going to load the workpiece of the machine. What's next? So, um, locate. Locate part set tools. What's next? Run the program. What's next? Yeah. Did you run one program? I think everybody ran their part in two setups, right? So what's next? Flip the part over. What's next after that? Yeah. But not the tools, because they're still in the machine, right? What's next?
run program. What's next? What's next? Yeah. Yeah, what's next? Yeah. Um, and, and you may do that before the inspection, right? So let's just assume the part passes inspection. But you may want to, there may be some post-processing. Like, what, what kind of post-processing might we want to do on the parts that you guys made? Yeah. So take the burrs off, things like that. Okay, what's next after that? So we've deburred the part. It has passed inspection. If it fails inspection, we need to either scrap it or put it in for rework, right? We're going to ignore that part of the process for now. Passed inspection. <clears throat> what else? What's next? Well, that would be the inspection part, I think. Yeah. Which one do you guys want to do? Store or package the part? Yes. Why? Storing the part does not get it to your customer. If you don't have somebody that wants to buy the part, you should rethink whether or not you should make the part. Um, but yeah, so but we may have to. So if we're selling them in packages of ten. We may be putting them in the package until we get to 10, and then we put them in. And there's, especially with a product like this, there's going to be some warehousing that happens, right? So there is going to be some storage because it's going to be hard to make enough to make it worth your while to send them to if you have a distributor or a middle person in this process. Um, I would guess, especially, but I don't know. That's how fast we can get this system running when we automate it. Um, so package the part. What do we do after we package the part? Yeah. I would actually send invoice and ship. What do manufacturing companies get paid for? Shipping the part or sending the invoice? You only get paid for sending the invoice. Actually, if you ever decide to be a consultant, you got to remember that too. You only get paid for sending the invoice. You don't get paid for knowing the answer. You don't get paid for telling them the answer. You don't get paid for discovering the answer. You get paid for sending the invoice. Okay. Um, this is pretty much the steps, right? We should probably up here say get orders right because that's certainly important for the company as the manufacturing engineers we're hoping that sales and marketing is doing that right um sometimes it might not be a bad idea to make sure sales and marketing is actually doing that but um but that unless you're a owner managers things like that i don't think you should have to worry about that right away all right so these are the steps to make those T-nuts. Which one do you want to automate? As the business owner, let me tell you, I want to automate this one and this one first. Right, because that's what I get paid for. But as manufacturing engineers, which ones do you guys want to automate? Yes. All right, so based on what you already know about manufacturing, what would, what would you like to do to automate the getting the stock and prepping the stock? I mean, so 
we could schedule, so we could, with our stock vendor, schedule a repeat delivery time, right? So we say we want to get this many bars every Monday. And as long as we continue paying our stock vendor, they will continue sending the bars unless they run out for some reason, right? So, so, so that is a step, the receiving the material, or at least having the material arrive at the loading dock, that's a step that we can automate with a phone call. Does not require a machine, right? We're automating that by talking to the vendor. How about the prepping the stock? Because that was what you were thinking when we said it, right? So how are we gonna automate the prepping of the stock? Yeah. Just figure out some way to, well, once you have it in a machine, you could just like keep a machine fed with a bunch of bars of it. Keep a machine fed with a bunch of bars of it. So we could do CNC bandsaw, but not the wood cutting. So, so you can buy a bandsaw like this that has a bar feeder attached to it. That's not too bad. I mean, we're going to make a boatload of money selling these tea nuts, right? All right, so, but let's, so that's for the saw, 22 grand for the saw. And, and what, what was the brand on the $22,000 one? Because this one's 60000 Google. Uh, it's a fairly good brand, as long as it's got this, the, the bar feeder stuff that we need. So we got to get this, we got to install it, right? And we got to somehow set it up. So let's call that thirty grand. All right. So we could automate the prep stock for about thirty grand. Because even if we didn't automate that, now do we still need an operator? So our automation didn't eliminate the need for the operator entirely. But now the operator needs to take the load of material, put it on the saw, and tell the saw to go. Right? And then occasionally I'm guessing he's gonna have somebody's gonna have to collect the parts that got prepped and get them to where the milling machine is, right? So we even, we didn't even talk about the transport step, right? Transport. And somewhere over here, right? So how do you automate the transport? Yeah. You could have a conveyor belt. Did I ever tell you about the time that I was moving? No. So, um, so I was moving. Did you see those commercials where the financial planner guy is like cheering at the kids' soccer games? You've seen this, one of the companies are like, we're there to support your whole family. And they're like the guy's cheering in soccer games. You've seen this, right? So um, the uh, my financial planner at the time had a background in manufacturing engineering. In fact, he had run a manufacturing company for a long time before he went into the financial planning business. And, uh, and so he didn't come to my kid's soccer game and cheer. When I was moving, he showed up at my house with a two-ton trailer and his 18-year-old son. So that was really cool. And so we're, we're moving and we're moving out of a three story house into a two story house about a mile away. And, uh, and another guy that came over to help uh, and when it's a mile away, it's really hard to get a moving company to do it. Cause it just feels like it's only a mile away. Right. Once I moved around the block and I just carried everything on the sidewalk, didn't even use a truck. Um, but so one of the guys says, Hey, we should just build a conveyor between the two houses. Right. And the other one looks at him and says, that would just be automating waste. We should move the two houses closer together, right? But a conveyor is a, is a method to do that. There's there's other there's there's actually little robotic things like like little robotic forklifts, right? And so you could fill up a pallet, and then the little robotic forklift could move the pallet over to the other place. So there's ways to automate that transportation step too. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Can be value added. In some applications, conveyors can be value added. So if the uh, if you've got to heat treat a thing and it's going to go into a heat treating furnace, right? And it's got to be in that furnace for a certain amount of time, 
if you build a long tunnel shaped furnace, then you could have the conveyor bringing the parts through, and when they come out the other side, they're done, right? So you could do that. Um, I was in a, uh, we were talking about farming earlier. Turns out fishing is similar to this too. I was once in the factory where they make the fish stick things. <laughs> and so you walk in there and it looks like a machine shop. They got big band saws and stuff like that. And they get these frozen fish and they're just whoop through the bandsaw, whoop through the bandsaw, right? And so, but they had a chain conveyor system for the frying, right? And so they had, somehow, I can't remember if they automated the breading part, but they get the bread on the fish, put it on the conveyor, it goes through the fryer, it goes into a flash freezer, and then it goes into the freezer, right? And so there, that conveyor was adding value because it was bringing the material through the cooking medium. Um, yeah, that was, that was an experience. If you ever get a chance to go to one of those places, go to the ones where they do the frozen fish, though. I wouldn't go to, like, the canning plant where it's, like, not frozen. I think it smells different. Um, so that's good. Uh, all right, what, what else could we automate besides that prep the stock and the move, move the material? Oh, we're going to leave move the material to a, a different day. What else can we automate? Like, what do you mean? Like, putting a part in, setting the offsets. So, all right. So, setting the offsets, I wrote it down. We're going to set the offsets once. So, we're not going to have to do that. So, we'll have some sort of a fixture that's designed so that you can't put the part in the machine in the wrong place. Right? So, so we could actually just eliminate those steps because we don't have to do them. Other than when we're setting up the whole system. So, um... Load work piece of the machine, though. But we could totally do that with a robot or something, right? Um, that same robot could flip the part over, right? A, that same robot could take the part out of the machine and drop it in the package, right? Okay, so we could we could do that with a robot. What's that robot cost? Anybody guess? Set up and operating. So something that could tend to minimal. I'm going to say nah. but the robot itself may be 30 grand, but you got to get it set up. You got to get it programmed. You got to have maintenance. You got to have laser fence around it so that people don't get killed. Um, you may be able to do it with a, um, what do they, they call them? The cobots now. If you could do it with a cobot, then you can eliminate the laser fence. You save some money. You might get down to 80 grand, 90 grand. But somewhere in this range, so I'm going to say 80 to 150. That's my guess. If, I think if you paid more than 150 for it, you paid too much. Um, you can do all those things. Take the part out. Package the part. Okay. So if we want to automate this process, what do we, what do we need? So we're going to do it in one like mini mill or something like that. So what's it, so let's just say that we have to buy the mini mill too, right? Because we're going to set up a production line. So mini mill. And so what's the mini mill cost? Or you want the super? Get super? Okay. 60K for the super that's just like the one we have over there. Oh, wait. No, that was with the educational discount. Maybe it's like 75. All right. So what's our, what's our manufacturing line going to cost? Assuming that that, it, and so let's ignore the fact that we had to rent the space to put it, right? The real estate taxes and stuff like that we had to pay. So what's it cost? If we go high end, 150, 90, 75, 190 plus 75, 265. So a quarter of a million dollars to build our automation system to make these T-nuts with one cell, right? How long did it take to make a T-nut? Cutting time. How many? What was the cutting time on your T-nuts? Somebody guess. Let's pick a number. I won't know the difference.
Eight minutes. Both sides? Yeah, that's not including like the Not including the flip over. So if we include the flip over with the robot and stuff like that, what do you want to call it? Nine minutes? So how many do we make in an hour? If they're nine minutes each, we make six in an hour? Yeah, okay. No, that's the word because we're all right. So it's going to cost us a quarter of a million dollars to build this factory. Discounting the fact that we need a factory place to put it in. All right, that's just for the machines. So a quarter of a million dollars to get into the factory. We can make with this setup roughly six an hour. We'll, 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 we'll tweak the program. We'll get it to seven an hour. Okay? So we make seven an hour. How many do we make in a day? It's automated. Two hundred or so, right? Or is, is it that low? One sixty-eight. One sixty-eight. So, all right. So, one hundred sixty-eight parts a day. Um, oh, so our investors that gave us the two hundred fifty thousand dollars, they want their money back in three years. Is it possible? So we're making. Well, how many we're making? One hundred and seventy a day. One hundred and seventy a day. Let's call it. Let's call it 150 a day. There's going to be down moments, right? So we can make 150 of these a day. How much do we have to sell them for for our investors to get their money back in three years? So, so we have to make a dollar fifty to repay the investors. I think let's go buy some machines. Because how, how much? Somebody, Ryan, you're on a computer. How much does it cost to buy one of those T nuts? MSC Direct. It's possible we should go buy some machines and fill up our room. Four dollars each. If we sell them for two bucks, or so if we can make them for two bucks, we can sell them for four. Oh no, MSC sells them for four bucks. We can sell them to MSC for two bucks. Still possible, right? So, so those are the kind of considerations you're going to go through whether you're setting up an automated manufacturing facility or a, a not automated manufacturing facility. No, we forgot labor, right? Because we still have an operator. We have at least. Two operators, because we're going to have a person there for first and second shift. We might let it run third shift unattended, but we're going to have a person there for first and second shift. The, uh, there's, a, there's a great book called The Factory of the Future. Um, Jay Black wrote it, Factory of the Future. One, someplace in the book, and I tried to find the direct quote, but uh, it, it talks about this factory of the future where the only employees are a guard and a dog. The guard's job is to feed the dog. The dog's job is to make sure the guard doesn't touch any of the damn machines. <laughs> All right. So um, what's today? We're at 54. I went over a little bit. Um, so um, you guys have lab tomorrow, right? In lab tomorrow, you should all be able to make a keychain or a, a bottle opener thing and run your engraving program on said bottle opener thing as long as you arrive at lab with an engraving program. So see what you can do to do that. Use that uh, the, the Learn CNC thing, the WPI CNC thing, as a reference if you need that. Or if you need other references, you've got the, the Haas Programming Workbook stuff. Did anybody in the Haas Programming Workbook find the thing about the engraving code? Pro tip, you might want to look up Haas engraving code. Because your program could be one line of code. Just saying. Yes. Um, uh, but it but it won't be a fancy scripty thing. Once as we do we do this with uh, with another class that we teach where uh, they uh, they write this code. One guy did it like a dot matrix printer. Instead of instead of going around like this. 
he set a bunch of points that were next to each other. And then he used a drill cycle, one of the canned drilling cycles, and just had it go. It's kind of cool. It was the most innovative one that I've seen yet. You saw my example on the little sheet there was not very innovative, and I didn't set the tool offset correctly. It's pretty gouged, wasn't it? Pretty deep. Yeah, still worked. I traded that for this 3D printed titanium one. Just saying. All right. So my bottle opener thing had value, right? It made me wealthy until I gave it to somebody else. <clears throat> oh, and the thing for the homework assignment I told you about, that actually I, I published it this morning. I made it yesterday. I thought it was published yesterday, or whatever, the two days ago. But I realized this morning it wasn't published. I clicked it. It's just to do one exercise from the book. You'll snap through it like that. 